Hello, everyone. I'll let some folks hop into our webinar today. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Very, very warm welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Sarah Martin, and I'm the Manager of Programming and External Relations at the Center for Effective Philanthropy. The theme for today's discussion is Bridging the Gap, Grantee Perspectives on Intermediary Funders. We're so glad you've joined us. For those of you who are tuning in and are new to CEP, I'd love to share a bit, a bit, a bit about us. Our work is focused on philanthropic effectiveness. For more than two decades, we have sought to help foundations and increasingly individual donors to improve their effectiveness and increase their impact. We do this through assessments and research reports that often lift up the perspectives of those who wouldn't otherwise be heard, as well as programs like this one. We also do this through our Youth Truth Initiative, which harnesses student perceptions through validated surveys and tailored advisory services to help school leaders and education funders accelerate improvements. We're a nonprofit and we do rely on grants and contributions to support our research and programs like this one. So please reach out if you would like um, to support us. Through October 31st, um, you can also receive a discount on one of our grantee donor or staff perception assessments in 2025. So please reach out if you work at a foundation and would like to learn more about our assessments. On behalf of CEP, I want to thank the advisory group for the Bridging the Gap report who provided meaningful feedback and input throughout the study, and a very special thank you to the funders whose support made this research possible, the Ford Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Next, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, we are in webinar format, of course, which means you are all muted and have your videos off. If you have questions for the panelists today, and we have great panelists, and we certainly hope that you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel at the bottom of the screen. We'll try to be as responsive as we can to as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. We will not be using the hand raising function on this webinar as we're not asking attendees to speak their questions. And if you do require technical assistance, please reach out to my colleague, Amy Keith at Amy, a-M-Y-K at CEP.org, and she can assist you. We'll also be sharing some resources with you via the chat box, so feel free to check there for helpful links. If you'd like to enable live captioning, please click the closed captioning button in your Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen. And finally, our webinar is being recorded today, and we will send a link to all registrants in a follow-up email. We will also send a follow-up email with links to the resources you will hear about today. Now that housekeeping is out of the way, I have the privilege of introducing our speakers and panelists. First, my colleagues, Alicia Smith Ariaga, CEP's Vice President of Research, and Emily Yang, Senior Analyst on the research team, will share a brief overview of the report's findings. Moderating today's session is Stephanie Beasley, Senior Writer at the Chronicle of Philanthropy, where she covers major donors and charitable giving trends. We're joined by three fantastic panelists, Pam Foster, COO of CoImpact, a global funder collaborative focus on funding systems change, Jess Goodfriend, Chief Implementation Officer at Birth Center Equity, a nonprofit regrantor that aims to increase access to birth center care in all communities through building and sustaining birth centers led by BIPOC leaders, and Monique Miles, Vice President of the Aspen Institute and Opportunity Youth Forum. We're so grateful to all of you for joining us today. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Alicia. Thanks so much, Sarah. We are super excited for you to be joining us today as we talk about um, the results of this research on intermediaries. So just for context for this work, when we talk about intermediaries, we're referring to entities that re-grant philanthropic dollars on behalf of another funder. And these intermediaries can take the form of nonprofits that regrant funds, or they may be collaborative pool funds. And we can go to the next slide. Now, recently, there's really been a notable increase in the number of intermediary funders in recent years, and a lot of discourse about why funders would consider working with them. So, for example, intermediaries might have closer proximity to the issues and communities they're funding. Some say that intermediaries are better positioned for progress on issues related to equity, 
and are able to provide more support to nonprofits that funders may not be aware of. And there are other arguments that pooling funds can provide more funding on a broader scale, resulting in greater visibility and potential impact. We can go to the next slide. Now, when we looked at the existing literature on intermediaries and we thought about, um, you know, some of this current discourse, what we found was that the majority of reports that are currently cited in the field are based on data collected from intermediaries themselves or from other types of funders. And what was missing from that conversation was really the perspective and the experiences of those who ultimately received this funding, grantees. So with CEP's grantee perception report data, we found ourselves uniquely positioned to be able to lift up grantee perspectives and how they experienced working with intermediaries compared to other funders. And so now I'm gonna turn it to my colleague, Emily Yang, who's the primary author on this report to help us dig into the data. Thank you so much, Alicia. So with that, um, let's dive into a bit of our methodology. This research is based on data collected through the Grantee Perception Report, as Alicia mentioned, which is a survey that CEP fields so that funders can receive candid comparative feedback from their grantees. Between 2013 and 2023, we collected over 62,000 grantee responses from 364 funders. And within this group, 3,444 grantees responded about their experiences working with 24 intermediary funders in this data set. Looking at those 24 intermediaries, we're curious about the types that they might be represent and found that they fall into these three broader categories. So first there are freestanding nonprofits, which are nonprofits that provide regranting programs for donors while also raising money more broadly for their own grant making. We also have some donor collaboratives which are supported by a smaller number of funders that pool resources to focus on specific topics or geographic regions. And finally, there's a small number of other intermediary funders that didn't fall into the two categories just mentioned. There are a few other types of intermediaries that we didn't include in this research. Specifically, we did not categorize needy foundations as intermediaries, and we haven't fielded the GPR or any donor advised funds or giving circles. This research also included some interviews. And so we used the GPR data to identify and interview two intermediary funders that received high ratings from their grantees, specifically Brownsville Fund and the Conservation Lands Foundation. We also asked them if some of their grantees would be willing to speak to us about their experiences and also interviewed five of their grantees. So these interviews are comp compiled in the two profiles which are included in our research report published online. Overall, to briefly summarize our methods, we drew upon the perspectives of organizations that either participated in a GPR survey or were interviewed by CUP, and used these to inform the findings that we'll be sharing in the upcoming slides. So first we wanted to elevate the level of variation that we found in this data, both among intermediaries, as well as other, or what we call originating funders. The intermediaries in our data set differ from each other in several ways, as seen in this table, along with the corresponding data from originating funders that are also in our data set. Specifically, we see that intermediaries we studied range from having 2.5 million to 187 million in assets in terms of annual giving, can provide anywhere between 433,000 to $80 million. And in terms of full-time staff, have between anywhere between two to 330 staff. On a funder by funder basis, we see that there's variation in the ratings that intermediaries receive from their grantees. Some intermediaries rate higher in certain areas compared to other intermediary funders. And this mirrors what we see among originating funders as well in this data set. On average, however, we did not find substantial differences in grantee experiences between intermediary and originating funders. We did find some statistically significant differences that were small in magnitude, which was what we'll be looking more into in the following sections. 
Our next set of findings focuses on comparing grantees' perceptions of intermediary and originating funders in areas like impact, understanding, and relationships. Grantees report that intermediaries have similar levels of impact on their fields compared to originating funders and that they exhibit similar levels of clear communication and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Grantees also find that intermediaries are slightly more likely to advance knowledge in grantees fields and to have a slightly deeper understanding of those fields compared to other funders. Here we can see the differences in the average ratings for these two groups of grantees. On the left, you'll see how grantees rate funders' advancement of knowledge in grantees' fields. And on the right, ratings for funder understanding of grantees' fields. Grantees also see intermediary funders as providing slightly more open and frequent communications. Specifically, intermediary funder, intermediary grantees report having a slightly better understanding of how their own work fits into their funders' broader efforts, and that their intermediary funders are slightly more open to ideas from grantees about their strategy, and that their funders are reaching out on a more frequent basis. On this slide, you can see the exact differences in the average ratings for how well grantees understand the context of their own work and their funders' openness to ideas about strategy. At the same time, grantees indicate intermediary funders have slightly lower levels of impact and understanding of grantees' work when compared to other funders. These charts show the exact differences in the average ratings for those two measures. Grantees of intermediaries also give slightly lower ratings in areas related to the funder-grantee relationship, indicating that intermediaries exhibit slightly lower levels of trust in grantee staff, respectful interaction, and compassion for those affected by grantees' work. And here you can see the differences in the average ratings for those three relationship measures. One of the intermediary funders we interviewed, the Conservation Alliance Foundation, is an intermediary funder that received high ratings from their grantees in terms of relationships. And one of the pieces of, of advice that came out of that interview for funders interested in working with intermediaries is to treat relationships between intermediaries and grantees as partnerships to ensure that nonprofits are benefiting as grantees of those intermediaries. Moving on to our last set of findings. These are based on the nature of the grant funding received from intermediaries compared to originating funders. On average, grantees of intermediary funders receive somewhat smaller grants. Among grantees of intermediaries, the median grant size is $75,000, which is half the median grant size of grants from other funders. We also see a slight difference in likelihood of receiving general operating support. 20% of intermediary grantees report receiving a general operating support grant compared to 27% of grantees of other funders. This continues for multi-year grants, where one third of intermediary grantees report receiving a grant lasting longer than a year, while more than half of grantees from other funders indicate the same. Among the many suggestions that grantees provided for their intermediary funders, grant funding characteristics came up the most often. One grantee writes, we would appreciate the ability to strategically grow our organization beyond the boundaries of project-specific one-year or two-year grants. It is hard to scale up when all of your funding comes from project grants. So to summarize what we've covered thus far, we see that there is a wide variation in grantee experiences across intermediaries, similar to what we see among originating funders. Grantees indicate that differences between intermediaries and originating funders do exist, but are small in magnitude. As we can see in this table, intermediaries receive slightly more positive ratings than originating funders in some areas, such as understanding and advancing knowledge in grantees' fields. 
In other areas, though, grantees rate intermediaries slightly lower, as seen in the relationships and the organizational impact and understanding measures in this table. Differences also exist in terms of grant-making characteristics, as grantees of intermediary funders tend to receive slightly smaller grants and are slightly less likely to receive multi-year unrestricted grants. And to our knowledge, these findings represent the largest population of intermediary grantees that have been studied thus far. Given the variation between funders and the patterns of similarities and differences highlighted by grantees, we hope this research sparks an open, honest conversation about what it takes for funders and intermediaries to best support grantees and build strong, equitable relationships in the philanthropic sector. With that, I will stop sharing my screen and we'll pass it to Stephanie for the next portion of the webinar. Great, Emily, thank you so much. And I would like to now welcome Pam, Monique, and Jess to have a discussion. And Alicia, I think you are still there with us as well. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk about uh, the report's findings. Uh, for me, as somebody who's been covering intermediaries for the past few years, I found a lot of it really interesting and new, mostly because I think when I talk to um, people about intermediaries, they tend to be the intermedia intermediaries themselves. So I'm wondering if each of you could kind of talk about excluding Alicia, because of course you, you help conduct the report, but if Pam, Jess, and Monique could talk about your initial reactions to the findings, what were some of the big takeaways that you had? And, and let's start with you, Monique, your center in my screen. Okay, well, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Thank you to the Center for Effective Philanthropy, Alicia and you, Stephanie, for moderating this conversation. So I'll just share quickly that uh, my name is Monique Miles. I'm a vice president at the Aspen Institute, and I lead a national fund here in the United States that supports rural, urban, and indigenous communities to redesign education and careers with young people, particularly young people of color at the center of both identifying the challenges and barriers to meaningfully accessing opportunity, and then based on their lived experience, expertise, culture, race, knowledge, identity, deeply rooted in each of those areas as um, just positive affirmations, centering that in the redesign of, of education career pathways so that young people are meaningfully reconnected to opportunity in a way that both disrupts intergenerational poverty and creates new narratives around wealth, around community, around belonging, and about the power, the transformative power of young people. Um, and so as an intermediary, we have several roles that we play for the field. The first is we are a funder collaborative. We also spend a lot of time convening our network and delivering technical assistance. We also do grant making across our network. Um, and we are really big, not just on documentation, but the translation of learning at the field level based on the progress that our communities are making. And then we spend a lot of time focusing on policy and advocacy and also identifying narratives and counter narratives. And I only say that to say that um, and looking at the research and the findings, a really big thing that I was sitting with is how um, multifaceted intermediaries can be, how intermediaries can play such diverse uh, roles across the field, both in terms of the work that we do with communities and translating that for funders, translating that for philanthropy, translating that for across sectors and systems. And I would even add, it's not just the translation across sectors and systems, it's also the intersectional nature of this work as well that we spend a lot of time translating, because of course young people will say we don't live single issue lives. And so a lot of what we're able to do is also really meaningfully connect the dots around learning. So the two Two things I was sitting with that I would say is thinking a lot about, again, the diverse and I would say um, multifaceted nature of the um, intermediary role. And my other thing that I was sitting with, especially as I was looking at this idea of um, the benefits that it sounds like grantees may get from an intermediary versus the originating funder, I was also thinking about the difference between technical issues and adaptive issues. So much of what the social sector is working to address now are these really big existential questions around shifts in demography, technology, climate, social movements, wealth 
wealth inequality, political polarization. So I also was sitting here thinking about how intermediaries need to be able to hold those really, really complex issues in ways that help the many different stakeholders make sense and meaning of them based on where they sit sit in the, the ecosystem. And so we really are talking about adaptive solutions that are quite complex. And I would say intermediaries are uniquely positioned to hold that complexity in ways that help it make sense based on the unique partner they're working with across the ecosystem. And so excited to continue on this learning journey that helps us understand, I would say, in even deeper, more rich, nuanced ways, the roles of intermediaries. Great. And, and Pam and Jess, I wonder if you can kind of elaborate on some of what Monique talked about with the role of intermediaries from your perspective and some of the key takeaways that you have from the report. I'll start with you, Jess. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm Jess Goodfriend, I use they them pronouns, and I'm Chief Implementation Officer for Birth Center Equity. To just briefly introduce our work, um, Birth Center Equity is mission is to invest in Black, Indigenous, and people of color run birth centers to grow and sustain community birth infrastructure for generations. And what that means, I think, in a very practical sense, is that we steward and resource a network of what is now 48 BIPOC-led um, birth centers who are in all stages of development and established operation across the country um, to really like build infrastructure in their own hyperlocal um, area of focus. And so I very much, I very much resonate with what Monique shared. I think that, you know, one of the things that I was a little bit surprised about in the report was actually that some of the statistical difference wasn't actually greater than what I expected with intermediaries versus um, originating funders, just because um, in my own experience, um, both as a recipient of funds through intermediaries in my current position with BCE, but also in my former life as um, an ED of a small uh, community nonprofit in New Mexico, is that actually like the felt sense of what it means to have even a fraction more relationship, even a little bit more time, I think does translate to a very unique funder relationship and a much more, in my experience, responsive funder relationship. So I know that many of us, you know, receive philanthropic dollars from many sources. We're willing to work with funders in a variety of different ways um, in order to, to resource our work. And um, I think when funders even know just a little bit more about who we are and what we do, and maybe I'll give an, uh, an example um, with our experience with Groundswell, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, we were still trying to help folks understand how birth justice existed along the continuum of reproductive justice, right? So how it lived in the same home as, you know, contraceptive access, um, potentially abortion care, um, and everything that exists along the reproductive health timeline and continuum. Um, and Groundswell is an organization that didn't need us to put all those dots together for them, right? Instead, they already understood the larger framework in which we were working in. And so we could actually get into um, the details and the specificity of what it meant to implement in an indigenous community, a full spectrum clinical program. Um, so I'll just pause there and, and pass so, to you, Pam. Just mm -hmm. to, to make sure I understand what you're saying. So it sounds like your sort of experience firsthand was that, you know, your work with the intermediary. I know in the report, they found that um, the understanding of the grantees work wasn't percentage wise much greater than the originating funder. But your experience was mm -hmm. that Groundswell really did have a deep understanding of the work that you were doing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so I think more of a felt sense of, um, you know, cross-sectional movement partners or partners who are also very invested, if not directly shaping the landscape, like very much tracking and investing in the shaping of the landscape um, and how it impacts communities, right? Like how community voice is really represented inside of what, you know, often becomes a more intellectual and academic process of defining issue areas, right? Which which fundamentally shapes the way that resources flow into our communities. 
Pam, I wonder if you could hop in here and sort of talk about, I don't know if you had the similar reaction of being surprised that the, the you know, percentages weren't higher for intermediaries or what was your sense of the findings? And maybe you can talk a little bit too about some of the, the challenges and opportunities you do see for intermediaries. Sure. Um, so just uh, by way of introduction first, um, I'm Pam Foster. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of CoImpact. We are a funder collaborative. So we bring together funders from around the world and we provide large scale flexible grants to locally rooted organizations all in the global south that are working to make health education and economic systems stronger for stronger and more inclusive. Um, so our funding partners come in and, and, and contribute to a pooled fund, and then we make grants um, that generally long-term support. We also provide a lot of support beyond the grant to use a CEP framing. Um, um, and then we also, we engage actively with our funding partners. Some of them participate in our governance, our board, or one of our advisory boards. Um, they don't have sort of direct decision-making on our grants, um, but they we do sort of bring together to make sure we're sharing with them what we're seeing and what we're learning. And we hear from them because a lot of them also fund in the same space, which is why they're they're part of our collaborative. Um, so make sure we're we're sharing with each other about what we're seeing. Um, um, and increasingly we're, you know, we're sharing obviously the impact that uh, the funding is contributing toward. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna echo a lot of what Monique and Jess have already said, um, you know, in terms of just general reactions. I, I mean, I think this, this report shows that intermediary funders are about as varied as originating funders. Um, we, you know, how we show up with our grantees, um, or we call our program partners, so I may use that term, um, you know, it matters a lot. Um, uh, the basic um, takeaway echoes what Jess just said. It's the same as I have when I'm looking at any of CEP studies on how funders support grantees. Um, that you know the decisions that we make about the kind of support that we provide and how we show up really matters. Um, and and you know, just a, a plug that you know we often don't know until we hear because we've asked by one of these surveys how we're showing up um, because the you know unless they're bold and they tell us um, so we we you know we learn a lot from from these sorts of studies. Um, you know I what what was surprising so it so. It wasn't surprising to me that there was a, a lot of very, or you know, that there wasn't a lot of variation because if you're comparing against the full data set, you're going to see, you know, the same sort of variation. It's also a, it's a it's a it's a you know 24 intermediaries, and you know, as Emily said at the beginning, it's a number of different types of intermediaries. So it's really hard, I think, to to dig in and understand what's different about intermediaries from this data set. Um, and for me, in what was what I was hoping to learn more of is what is unique because we are intermediaries. Um, and that that to me that, you know, that there there wasn't enough that came out in that was maybe um, uh, was certainly surprising to me. You know, the one area that is called out in this in the study is uh, the intermediate, uh, the uncertainty that intermediaries can be sort of passing on because of the challenges that we face. Um, in the funding flows from our originating funder. So that's a that's an interesting one to talk about. Um, but otherwise, it's really hard to tell. Like what are the the variations we saw in the data, how how much of that is because we are intermediaries and uh, you know, or the intermediaries are intermediaries and because they're they're sitting in that unique spot. Um, it was hard, it's hard to tell. Um, so, you know, yeah, at the end of the day, it's it's about the relationships that we have and how we how we work with our partners. Yeah, Alicia, I wonder. This seems like a good time to to ask you how you all were thinking about how to try to capture this grantee experience. And when you're looking at the the variation between intermediaries, of course, you all were careful to say you excluded donor advised funds, community foundations, giving circles, but. How how much of a challenge was it for you all, I guess, in looking at this, or how were you thinking about it going into this research? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that was really interesting, you know, when we started the research was when we looked at the grantee perception report data, you know, to Pam's point, there are 24 intermediaries in that data um, that serve thousands of grantees. But, you know, of course, that means we're only able to talk about the kinds of 
intermediaries that are actually really interested in um, getting feedback from their grantees. So that's a really interesting perspective in and of itself. I do think the thing that's really important that the data shows us is that, you know, given what I was saying in the beginning around like all the excitement around using intermediaries and using them as a tool, that it's really important who you choose, right, is what the data shows us. That like just the choice alone to use an intermediary doesn't automatically mean you're going to get closer to community or that you're going to reach your equity goals or that you're going to do some of those other things that we talked about. Because we see that the differences are not as stark as one might expect, it just shows that it's really important that funders put a lot of thought into what is it they're really trying to achieve and in choosing an intermediary, who is actually, what's the best choice to achieve those goals? Um, because it's not automatic given what we see in the data. So I wonder, and, and maybe this is something I, Monique, you can, I'll, I'll turn to you, but we are seeing like this explosion and in growth of intermediaries. They're becoming more popular. You have mega donors, very you know big names like Melinda French Gates, Mackenzie Scott using uh, intermediaries. And I wonder what your sense is of, of why we're seeing this growth. And maybe you can talk a little bit about how you have a discussion with a funder that maybe they, you know, you feel like they don't quite understand what an intermediary does. How do you have those conversations with them to sort of explain your work and make sure that you all are a good fit? Thank you for this question. I was sitting here like, um, particularly to Alicia's last point and Pam's last point, what I was really thinking about was Pam lifting up and this connects to the question you just asked, Stephanie, that one of the things that was interesting is also that intermediaries can mitigate risk, which I think is a big part of probably why we're seeing the proliferation or some of why we're seeing the proliferation of the use of intermediaries given this report's findings. And the piece after that, though, that the report lifts up is it's not just that intermediaries can mitigate risk, but what that means is that then intermediaries are uniquely positioned to do some really, really important fill building work that traditional foundations may not be able to do. First and foremost, they're able to invest in the types of organizations and community leadership that I was speaking to, that Jess was speaking to, or that Pam was speaking to. If you're a smaller nonprofit, you may not be able to either apply to a bigger philanthropy, meet the deadlines, hold those complexities, et cetera. So it means greater access potentially for people of color-led organizations or organizations that are deeply rooted in community. And the other thing that it does is it also helps our field learn in ways that are deeply rooted in culture and community. So what do I mean? What I mean is that in a very traditional traditional philanthropic relationship with a foundation, we have reporting criteria, we have metrics that we need to report on. And the relationship between an intermediary, we are uniquely positioned to say, and this gets at the conversation we have with funders interesting in investing in our network, we are uniquely positioned to say, yes, we care about all metrics. We very much care about the overall rate of youth disconnection. We care about how many young people are getting a high school diploma, how many people are getting a post-secondary credential, and how many young people are meaningfully connected to careers. But you know what else we care about? Our young people talking about their connections to their peers, their connections to their parents, their civic engagement, their civic lively, livelihood, what well-being looks like. So we are also uniquely positioned to help identify those metrics because they're so important to the stories that are meaningful to young people, their families, their peers, and their communities. So why are we also seeing this proliferation, I would say, is in part because of the unique way that we can hold and translate the culture um, the values, the community side that, and I think in a traditional philanthropic relationship may not rise to the level of what is going to get measured, what counts, or the stories that the social sector likes to tell about impact. We're just uniquely positioned to um, hold both of those pieces. And then the second, to get back to the second part of your question, which is even in conversations with funders, our conversation always starts out with values. I love this idea that each intermediary, like if you see one intermediary, you see one intermediary, we move and we function so differently. And I would say for us, we are deeply rooted in our values. And so what we would want a funder to know are these core foundational values that we hold and that we bring into everything, whether that's a relationship with a young person, a community-based 
based organization or a funder partner or how we are bringing together a national network and learning community so that as the work unfolds, we just have some really shared understanding, not just of the vision, the North Star, what it is that we're working to, but the values really ground us in our how, how we are going to get there and how we're going to hold community in the collective goals we've set between ourselves, the community, and our funder partner that's invested in our network. Pam, I wanted to, to come back to you, and I wonder if maybe you could sort of talk to about communication and how you can use communication between your, you know, you as an intermediary and the funder, and also with the grantee to deepen those relationships and to further understanding. Yeah, I mean that's the that's the key, right, to, to all of these relationships. Um, I, I mean, I, I would just. You know, our organizations are very different and focusing on very different things. But what Monique just shared is exactly how I would have described a lot of those upfront conversations for us. It starts at the at the first the beginning of that relationship and making sure that that we are aligned on what we're trying to do. You know, that our, our we find that our funders come to us for different reasons, um, but often it's you know because there there's something that we're able to do that they can't do alone. Um, and so, you know, they're able able to sort of leverage their funding with others, um, and um, and then contribute to something a little bit bigger than they, than they're maybe able to do. And that's, you know, some of our these are huge funders that are that are coming to our table, um, but it starts in those conversations with them when we're when we're talking about what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it and how we do it and making sure that we are fully aligned on um, those values and principles that Monique was just talking about. Um, there, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, and, and then to keep that conversation going as we, you know, as the relationship evolves. So it's, it's you know, maybe most important at that starting phase as we're, um, as we're, you know, as we're sort of pitching to them why they should join us um, and and building that relationship to make sure that we are aligned. We have had some funders that we start to have a conversation with and we see that we're not. And, and that's not going to work. It's not going to work for us. It's not going to work for them. It, it, you know, very early on, we had some who we thought we were aligned with and then and we had to sort of make a, make a choice to, to sort of not pursue um pursue that funding because it could ultimately sort of derail us from what we were what we knew we wanted to do stop me um, right there real quickly i was gonna ask yeah. i guess when you have those conversations what is that like because I, I think you know within philanthropy a lot of times the the funder has a lot of power so if you have someone come to you and you know you realize that this isn't really going to work out how do you have those conversations um i mean like like in most courting situations, usually you're you're both sort of coming to that conclusion at the same time. Um, but um, and and you know, frankly, more often than not, they're probably coming to that conclusion sooner than we would like, um, right? Um, like anybody asks, you know, uh, searching for funding. Um, but um, but yeah, it's it's been sort of difficult conversations because usually, but when we if we get to that point, we've been we've been working really hard at building a relationship, and so you know we have different ways that they can come in and partner with us. So sometimes we say, listen, the work that we're funding really large scale long term projects, and maybe you should just be funding not just, but you know why don't we share with you the kind the things that we're supporting, and you may fund them directly, and that has worked really well for some of our prospective funding partners, sometimes they come back around and then are interested in joining us later because they see it. Um, so, so, you know, we don't sort of break up with them, but we talk about a, you know, different type of engagement because that's, that's really key. The work that we're, we're funding takes all, all different kinds of, of support. Um, you'd also asked about the, you know, converse, the communications with the grantees, the, the program partners. Um, and that's really key to, um, you know, uh, around around this work, I mean, we've learned through the through this the surveys that we've done of our grantees with CEP and the conversations that we've had. Um, we've learned about what's working in the way we show up for them and what isn't working so well, and we've you know worked to to um, get that better. But making sure they understand the you know the nature of the support that we provide um, and how we're going to show up and what we're going to ask of them. There, it's no different than any other funder working with a grantee. It really isn't, except 
the one thing that is, you know, making sure that if there are any things that sort of derive from the fact that we are a funder collaborative, making sure that we're clear about that. But frankly, we see that as our job not to pass that on, not to to um, sort of, you know, we we manage that in the middle so that they they shouldn't have to. Jess, I wanted to ask you, you talked about the, the positive experience with Groundswell, which is one of the highly rated intermediaries in the CEP report. And, you know, we've heard a lot about feedback and the value of feedback. And I wonder if you can talk about how you all have been able to provide feedback to Groundswell and how you've seen that incorporated and, and used in your relationship. But also if you're collecting feedback as well, how do you use that and, and you sort of take steps forward to make sure that, that it, you're not sort of repeating mistakes or, you know, discrediting or, or discounting information from your grantees. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I think um, the relationship, well, I'll say that the experience with Groundswell, and I think that this is really relevant to the conversation as a whole, is um, the, our organization received actually like the first round of funding in one of their funding streams as it was created, right? So there was a relation, there was a relationality where we felt like we were in a co-creation around the actual funding stream um, that they were using to support our work. And so particularly in those first few years, we would have these kind of lengthy check-in sessions. And, you know, one of the things that I appreciated and in my work overall, and, you know, maybe this is just like one particular experience, but it was first intermediaries that pivoted to using, you know, conversational reports uh, as an option versus written reports. Um, and I found that in those conversations, there's really like the opportunity to give feedback or have more nuanced conversations about, you know, how we're being impacted by the funding, um, what feedback, you know, we have for them around how it could potentially be more useful. Again, an example of a fund that pretty much only gave general operating support from the beginning, um, which was part of kind of the initial feedback that went into creating the fund. So, you know, some of it was that there was an established relationship from the beginning that we were in a conversation. So it was okay to be in a conversation, right? Which is also just a very different power dynamic than responding to an open RFP where you're like, okay, so what, what is it that you all want to hear and how does that fit with our work? Um, and how do we kind of craft a language that, you know, suits, suits both things simultaneously. So, I think in that way, it's like a very different ask um, from, from the start. And then I would say in our experience um, at Birth Center Equity, there's a there's a similarity that we are we always base funding requests in conversation, right? So part of it is that the funding, it is a co-creation from the beginning. It's a conversation about what do you need? What do we have capacity for? How could we potentially plan together into the future if we don't have capacity to support you right now? And so for us, it's also the kind of intimacy that um, can be generated in a, a network of under 50 partners right now, right? Um, and so I think like we have specifically crafted a due diligence process um, that is a conversation. And I think, you know, in terms of like a relationship based um, connection and contract, I think we're all trying to figure out like, what does that mean? What do we have time for? What do we trust one another with? Um, and what does it mean to have accountability? And I think our frame is very much that accountability exists within community, right? So accountability should never exist between um, community and philanthropy as the foundation of accountability structure. So that we have a very clear political framework around that. But what we understand as a funder and someone um, moving resources into communities is that we actually have to know that organization enough to know that they're in accountability with their community, right? And so I think that is where the feedback loop becomes multi-layered. So it becomes, you know, between like community and community partner and then um, community partner with us as BCE. And then I think there is another feedback loop that goes out to our originator funders as well. Um, and just really appreciating um, that sometimes also there are conversations that we can have as an intermediary inside of those feedback loops where we're actually having feedback conversations between community members and originating funders that are more difficult to have directly, right? So that's one of the ways that we can show up is um, to your point, Pam, around like sometimes we find funders that might not be a good fit 
maybe not for us, but hey, they're funding in our ecosystem. Like they are talking to the folks that we're talking to. And so we can often have um, a strategic positionality in giving feedback that might otherwise impact somebody's, you know, very essential funding streams or might feel too risky for community partners um, to deliver. And so we consider that definitely our responsibility in the ecosystem to have those conversations, even if we know that maybe at the end of the day, we're not the perfect partners, folks, we're not seeing the same vision or, you know, we're not in alignment around resource distribution. Um, I think there is, uh, yeah, I think it's just a way that the multiple levels of feedback um, can work both through and with intermediaries and community. So it, it sounds like, you know, feedback is important and having that communication between the intermediaries and the grantees and the intermediaries and the originating funders. Um, one thing I guess we've we've gotten from this report in terms of feedback from grantees is that um, you know they're less likely to receive multi-year unrestricted uh, funding if they get receive it from an intermediary versus an originating donor or funder. So I I want to ask I guess about that you know what your thoughts are about that and maybe what the funders can do, the originating funders can do to be helpful to intermediaries on this issue. Um, Monique, I see you're nodding. So I'll start with you. Yeah, I was um, surprised. That was a finding that surprised me. Uh, and I definitely think that that's one of the most important. I mean, just I think just laid this out uh, in a very elegant way, the unique positionality we have as intermediaries to have those conversations that maybe some organizations are not positioned necessarily to have, particularly as it relates to multi-year funding, core support, what we know communities need to do this intergenerational work in a sustainable, comprehensive, holistic way. So I say that to say that it... Um, at least for us, we we work really thoughtfully with our community grantee partners to do what the report suggested, which is we commit to um, one year of support. We do that. We do do the annual um, year grant. However, our commitment to our grantee is multi-year, three to five years, depending on whatever the initiative is or the deep substantive work that we may be invested in. But I will say structurally, the idea that we are only positioned to make a one-year grant, even as we are espousing a multi-year commitment, I recognize that there is a lot sitting in there that is fundamentally disruptive to the type of work we really are designed, I, th I would say, have the responsibility to support communities to do. So I would say for the originating funder, to me, this feels like a critical, you know, like what are some of the levers that we can pull or some of the recommendations that we should really push on. And I would say we already know that these issues didn't happen overnight. These are intergenerational challenges communities are working to address. We know that they need multi-year core support. So ensuring intermediaries are well positioned to be able to do that feels like it is one of the easier ways that we could get to um, just supporting communities to be able to do greater work, achieve greater impact, have more of the resources at hand that they need. Even the report bringing up, for example, you know, someone telling a story of, so I, when I'm hiring someone, I can only guarantee them one year of employment. We know that that's not sustainable livelihood for anybody doing the kind of work that we are supporting. So I would say structurally on the side of philanthropy, this is an area that feels like we need to address as soon as possible, given the vision we have for the work all of us are doing. And, and you know, Monique mentioned that this was a surprising finding. And, and Alicia, I wanted to come back to you and, and talk about how you feel like this report opens the door for further research, what you all are planning. And, you know, from the other panelists, if there are particular areas that you would like to see, maybe CEP or others look into in terms of intermediaries. But I'll start with you, Alicia. Yeah, I mean, you know, just kind of doubling down on what Monique shared, I think the thing that's interesting is in so much of our other research, right, we find that, you know, we know the research shows that organizations being able to do their work often depends on having flexible funds that they can use in ways that are pertinent to the moment. And, you know, it would follow that this data would show the same here. 
And that, um, you know, I think one of the things we'd be really excited and interested in looking at more is kind of digging more into that. Like, why is it the case that intermediaries are re I mean, likely receiving funds with restrictions, which then they are having to pass along, right? And so, you know, I, I would say actually for me, that finding in this report was one of the most interesting ones because I'm, to Monique's point, if we're doing work that's intergenerational, we can't, that, that is not year by year work. And so, you know, what are some of the research questions we can ask to try and get at that a little bit more and understand like why folks are making those decisions and maybe even highlight examples of places where people have been able to break through that kind of funding for intermediaries and really make change, I think could be super powerful. You know, the other thing that we would love to do more research around is you know, just having more data from grantees about their experiences. Um, you know, I said it in the introduction, and I think it just bears saying again here that, you know, really understanding like what the grantee experience is like is super important. And, you know, the fact that Pam, Monique, and Jess are here is not by accident, right? Like, they've done a lot of great thinking from different seats about the experience of being a grantee of an intermediary, being an intermediary, what does that mean? Getting feedback. Um, but clearly that's not the case equally around the field. And so I think there's also a lot of work to be done just trying to push that conversation more around how folks are thinking about the actual grantee experience and digging into that in some future research too. I, I'm curious because, you know, I've heard from folks. I wrote a story about this report and I've heard from multiple intermediary groups since, you know, what their different reactions to it. I'm wondering what you have heard so far from, from originating funders, from intermediaries. What type of response are you getting? And is it your sense that maybe if people, because I know some folks weren't exactly happy, but maybe that will push people to provide more feedback, more information that you can use in future reports. So I, so I wonder what, you know, what kind of response you've gotten. Yeah, I mean, it's been really interesting, Monique, because, you know, the intermediaries as a topic generally, you know, one can say it's a little bit of a wonky kind of insider baseball <laughs> conversation, right? Um, if I was talking to my grandmother about intermediaries, I don't know off the bat, right, that we would we'd have to we'd have to start and then build up to exactly what, you know, get on the same page. And um, but even with that, this report has garnered, I think, even more interest and questions and excitement than we even thought it would. And I think some of that has had to do with, you know, the gut reaction of some folks is like, oh no, there are not as many differences as we thought. Does this mean we shouldn't use intermediaries? And the answer is no, that is not what this means at all. <laughs> like the main takeaway, you know, that I hope if folks walk away with nothing else from this conversation is like, be thoughtful about who you choose as an intermediary and make sure your values are aligned. And also make sure that that you, whether you're intermediary, a funder, or what have you, that you're in deep conversation and relationship with grantees, right? So that you actually understand the issues that folks and communities are working on. I think that's the underlying message here. That and then the piece around you can't fund intergenerational work year by year. I mean, that that is clear and that that is happening too. So I think those are two kind of big things that came out from this. So I think, you know, there's, like I said, there's been a lot of different reactions, but my hope is that like those are kind of two big takeaways that folks will walk away with. And and Pam and Jess, I wonder if you all could talk about any further research you're hoping, you know, gets explored. If it's, you know, about their relationship between originating funders and intermediaries or grantees, or what do you think are some dynamics worth looking into? You want me to jump in first? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, echo, I double click on everything that Alicia just said. We need more more of this data to really start to understand where there are, where there are variations. But I think I think the case studies in this case be, are key. I mean, I speak to to colleagues at a lot of other collaboratives about the kind the work that we do. And a lot of it's the, you know, the some of the technical stuff, but you know, conversations around how we overcome some of the challenges that come in um, you know, our we provide, you know, five and five to six years of funding. A lot of our funding doesn't come in with that kind of time horizon. And so what are the things that we've been able to do? I mean, that took a, a lot of deliberate structuring up front to be able to do that. And there are choices that we have to make around that. Um, 
But in some, you know, in that case, we're sort of able to overcome some of the limitations that our originating funders have, where they can't provide support for more than three or four years because of the limits they have. So um, I'd like to understand what others are doing to, to, you know, to sort of live in this space in between um, and be able to manage some of those dynamics. Uh, there's certain things that, you know, I feel like we've done that pretty well. There's other areas that I'm sure I could learn from others. So, so uh, you know, more of this, please, um, to, you know, those of you out there who work in collaboratives, encourage them to, to participate in the grantee perception report. I'm a big proponent of it for any funder. But I'd really love to see more of us um, doing this um, and contributing to the data set going forward, because I, you know, the more we learn, the better we can be. And I'll just add quickly, um, I think one of the areas that I'd be really interested in seeing more data, so birth center equity, we consider ourselves like the terminology that we're still sort of playing with is a practitioner run intermediary. So we are actually very much a part of the ecosystem that we are providing intermediary, intermediary relationship for. Um, and I think that that really has a significant impact around investment and longevity. Um, versus potentially, you know, an intermediary um, that acts more like a community foundation and does like, you know, cyclical funding in a variety of funding areas, right? So there's so many different types of intermediaries. For us, ours is so specific, and we are literally a part of the ecosystem that we're funding, which I think really um, colors the, the level and depth of relationship and also our commitment to long-term funding, even if, you know, we don't have those funds in the door yet ourselves. Um, so I would be really interested in a little bit of, um, a little more data, like qualitative data collection on the relationship that intermediaries have with the folks that they're funding and how the different types of relationships potentially impact. Um, and then, you know, I'm also really interested on the originator um, funder side, really understanding, um, how they feel like intermediaries are shaping the ways that they fund, but also like the issue areas where they fund, right? So is the low, is the existence of an intermediary in uh, an issue area a draw to fund that issue area, right? Um, does it somehow um, impact? And these are more sort of like qualitative questions, I think conversations with some of our larger originators to understand. Because I think that one of the, to the point about result, you know, solving intergenerational problems, work that is not going to be finished with any of us. Um, I think that one of the most harmful practices in philanthropy as a whole is the, the sort of trend following and the switching of subject areas um, that so often I think impacts work on the community level where folks are ending up, you know, they set up infrastructure to do something that is community responsive and all of a sudden it has to be, you know, sold in a different way. It has to grow a new program to be funding relevant, right? It has to build a whole new building so that folks want to continue to pour resources into that community who still have all of the same issues that all originate from the same fundamental sy systemic problems. Problems, right. And so this to me is one of like the more harmful um, practices inside of philanthropy. And I would really want to understand how originator funders um, are shifting this practice with intermediaries or if intermediaries are not actually having any impact on that shift. And it's altogether other information um, that would impact that particular problem area inside of philanthropy with originator funders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that sounds really interesting, actually. And I know, like, for example, like climate change is a space where you see a lot of intermediaries, equity work. So yeah, I think it would be interesting to see what, what is happening first. Is it, you know, driven by the funder interest or because there are intermediaries if the funders are following that? All right. So I wanted to leave time for some questions and we're getting some. So if you are in the audience and have some questions, please submit them. So there was one that I saw that was very similar to a question I was going to ask, which is, what is the next actionable step for intermediaries? What can we do today to start to shift practices for grantee benefit? So I don't know if anyone has a burning desire to take that question, but yeah, from our audience, what are some next steps? And I know, you know, in the report, we have several recommendations. I guess, how are you reflecting on that and thinking about how to move forward? I'm going to go to you, Pam. You look like you're ready. 
I mean, I'm always ready to talk about this, this subject. I think um, to me, it's all about incremental change, right? We're, we're going to, what are we going to hear about in the next time we, we hear from our grantees and what are going to be able to do a little bit better tomorrow? Um, understanding through sort of those conversations we have internally around, okay, what's what's happening with the nature of this funding coming in and how it's impacting what we're doing? How are we able to, you know, pivot our approach on this to be responsive to what we're seeing? You know, it it is it is not it's not major things. It's the, it's the, it's the inter incremental changes that I think are really key. Um, I, I also think, you know, so much of it, so much of what CEP has taught us over the years is that the, um, one of the key things is the relationship between the individual at the funder and the, and the grantee organization, right? So the program officer, that role really matters. You know, we sit in that space where we are both grantee and funder, and I can tell you it absolutely matters um, who we are engaging with at our funders end in terms of the experience we have. Um, and we take that seriously when we're working with our our um, our program partners to make sure that um, the relationship that they have with us is you know rooted in a in a positive relationship with their program officer. So um, so, you know, a lot of the work that we need to do internally on that is, is also just making sure that we are all digesting the results. We're going to do another survey this coming year, um, making sure we're, you know, learning from how we did. So it's, it's, it's that incremental change that I think is so key. Okay. We have another question, which I hope I am not going to bungle. It says, I am wondering about the value proposition of some intermediaries or collaborative platforms to donors who do not have foundation staff. How do the intermediary leaders on the panel think about that? So for donors who don't have staff, which we're seeing more of, people aren't establishing foundations, they're turning to intermediaries. What are your thoughts on that, um, Monique? You know, I I think this can be a really, really great way to do a couple of things because I'm sitting with Pam's comment about incremental change, which I agree with. And to borrow one of the phrases from my favorite um, womenist theologians, and I want to trouble it a little because I sometimes worry that incremental change is necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and then I also wanna pick up this thread that Jess just lifted up that feels so important as well, which is the idea that even when the pendulum swings occur with philanthropy in the ways that we do, intermediaries are uniquely positioned to still hold the big picture around these really important substantive issues and still do that translation work of helping philanthropy figure out, okay, but here's what um, continuing to invest in this looks like. Here's why it's so important. And even as you begin to shift, we can still play that really, really important role of being a buttress around how to continue to get resources where they are so necessary to get to. So to bring this all um, back to the question, you know, part of um, what I'm also thinking about is for donors who don't come from a traditional foundation, what we can help them do is understand the issue in a deep, deep, substantive way. We can help them understand place, context, and also the history of the challenges that have created these conditions. And we also can indoctrinate them on some of these practices that Alicia has been speaking to, that Jess has been speaking to, that Pam has been speaking to, so that maybe we're not necessarily deciding between incremental change, but for an individual donor who wants to invest in some pooled funding or some collective funding, they might have an opportunity to fund something bigger around an advocacy play that gets us a federal funding stream that can help move the needle, the needle a little bit more quickly than some other uh, different resources. And the other thing that they can help us do, those individual donors, is some of the cultural shift work that I also hear uh, Alicia speaking to in her own way or Pam speaking to in her own way or even just speaking to that feels like it's really important for intermediaries. Again, we sit in the middle, we play this really important role. And so as we think about what are some of those practices that are harmful, that perpetuate some of these inequities that communities feel 
through traditional grants, we can play that really important role of helping donors understand uh, the culture behind the types of practices we invest in and support so that um, in many ways they can be part of helping to fund those shifts that we wanna see in philanthropy over time. So I think they can be very positive depending on the type of relationship we have with them and how we indoctrinate them into the work, especially around values, practices and culture shifts. And, and Jess, I wonder if I can ask you because, and you know, I'm thinking about what Monique has said about cultural shifts. And I think, you know, one thing that I've been reporting on a lot is, is women funders, but also gender equity and reproductive rights. And, and I think this is a moment where you're seeing a lot of attention and you had mentioned, you know, people going, following trends and things, but this is an area where, you know, people I've talked to have said there needs to be sustained funding and it's sort of been ebb and flow, you know, when there's controversy, there's a lot of funding when there's not, you know, something controversial happening there's less funding and, you know, particularly there's less funding for marginalized communities who are dealing with reproductive rights and other issues. So I wonder if you can talk about, you know, what you think originating funders can do to help intermediaries in that space be most effective. Um, so I think a lot of times intermediaries have this gift where we have a story thread that we can help originating funders. And actually, I think this might even um, speak a little bit to um, the last question about um, even donors that have no staff. So um, for example, one strategy that Bristol Equity is toying with right now is a funder briefing strategy, right? Where we actually have in-person events, you know, quarterly in different geographies, we invite funders to come to those events. And a lot of it is around this kind of culture shift work that can help folks who like, there is nothing wrong to us about folks who are in this moment noticing for the first time that we are in a black maternal health crisis. Like we're not mad at people just, you know, coming on um, to this issue area in this moment. But the difficulty becomes when people think that they're at the beginning of a story that in fact has been going on for a very, very long time, right? And so I think that intermediaries in a lot of cases can really help to do that story building with originating funders and help them to understand like, hey, yes, this thing is happening right in this moment, but actually there's been generations of movement building that we are in line and continuity with um, that we would like to like bring into the story in this moment so that we can fund and not just um, uh, informed way of what, you know, what we're reading on the internet right now, but actually an informed way of a story that has started a lot, you know, a lot um, further back. And so I think a lot of times we can provide that support to originating funders to help them connect to that longer story. And in connecting to that longer story, be thoughtful about how they want funding to impact into future generations as well, right? And so I think that there's a lot of context building. Uh, some of us also that works inside of a culture shift framework to, right, to be like, you know, there's a way that we could talk about violence in this moment. There's also a way that we can talk about resistance over a much longer arc. Um, and those stories matter. And then how that shapes our funding also very much matters. Um, so yeah, we will pause there. Great. Well, thank you all so much. We are at time, but I want to thank you, Jess, Pam, Monique, Alicia, of course, for being here and talking and sharing your insights and your experience. And I'm going to hand it back over to Sarah. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to, to our fantastic panelists, um, to my colleagues, Alicia and Emily. Um, and certainly to you all for joining. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, bring our discussion today to a close. Um, and I wanna say a special thank you to Stephanie for moderating. Um, it was so great to have you, Stephanie. Um, we're such big fans of the Chronicle. So always, always a joy to have a chance to engage with one of their writers. Um, so we'll be sending out, if you haven't received it already, a survey in your inbox asking for feedback on this event so we can continue to improve our program offerings. So if you could take just a few minutes to fill it out, it would really, really help us. Um, we're, we're always looking for your feedback. So thank you again, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>